Hello everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today for our May FICA. And uh, you'll have seen that we're going to be talking about SDG 15. Um, this is a really exciting conversation we've got coming up. It's all around the development of a brand new AR app, which we'll be launching before much longer. And the aim is to help improve green infrastructure, biodiversity, community engagement, and nature-based solutions, all uh, tackling our current climate and biodiversity crises. I'm sure you're all well aware of those and also aware of the pressing need for more support in areas like this to improve the situation. So our speakers are Asha Peterson and Max Farrell. They're both involved in the launch of this, uh, the world's first augmented reality app for urban green, <coughs> excuse me, green placemaking. And it uses immersive technology um, and data, sorry, I've lost my thread, uses <laughs> big data uh, in a free app that empowers people everywhere to make their cities greener, healthier and more livable. So uh, the app invites the public to co-create their everyday spaces to achieve more widespread awareness of the benefits of green infrastructure and digital tools for public engagement are so often um, very costly, therefore exclusive by default and only really enable inclusive placemaking for the very few. And the hope is that wild streets will be used as a tool to promote the centralized collection and refinement of it's really important data to encourage entrepreneurship at a hyper local level from the bottom up. So Asher is founder and CEO of Wild Streets and Max is a non-executive director at Wild Streets, also founder and CEO of the LDN Collective. So welcome to both of you today. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know me, I'm Romy. I'm the commercial di director here at Vestra in the UK. And I should just mention we're recording this web webinar for catch up purposes. So I hope everybody's OK with that. Um, welcome, Max. Welcome, Asha. I'll just do a little quick intro before you start your presentations. Um, for those of you that are less aware, maybe, of the complexity of the SDGs, 15 uh, is a very broad one covering all life on land. And I think today's conversation around wild streets probably sits best within 15.9, which is that by 2020, um, and it, we're in the last 10 years of this, so by 2030, actually, to integrate ecosystem and biodiversity values into national and local planning, development processes, um, and uh, oops, sorry, development processes and uh, poverty reduction strategies and accounts. So I think it sits very well within that area. I'm sure you'll have lots of questions, so please add them into the Q and A tab rather than the chat and join the conversation after these presentations. So I'm going to hand over to you, Max, and uh, we'll have a chat afterwards. I shall stop sharing. Thank you very much, Remy, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Max Farrell, and I'm the uh, chief exec of an organization called the LDN Collective. Um, we're a, a, a network of um, about 50 different members who are specialists um, with different skill sets who are working in the built environment. And we are driven by social and environmental values. And, and that's uh, what uh, then leads us to collaborate on projects together. Um, so today, as Romy said, we're, we're going to be looking at um, uh, Wild Streets in particular and, and in the context of UN Sustainable Development Goal 15 about life on land. Um, I just thought I'd start by just showing one of the uh, relevant projects we worked on at the LDN Collective a few years back, which is actually how I got to know Asha and, and became involved in Wild Streets. Um, it was a project called Park Power, um, which we carried out um, during COVID. Um, and um, it was really about understanding uh, how people are using green spaces differently uh, and uh, what we can learn from that and making recommendations for the future. Um, and as I say, that that's how I connected with Asha and, and became an advisor to Wild Streets initially, um, and then just recently became a non-exec director uh, and also an investor. I've actually personally invested in shares as I really do believe it will have a, a major impact on, on, on this whole on topic and how we are addressing climate change, biodiversity, and public engagement. 
in that. So, I mean, personally, I think it, that the solutions to all the biggest challenges that cities are facing around the world, as we're dealing with the consequences of climate change and, and the biodiversity crisis, can be found within the natural environment. And our green spaces and our blue, blue spaces provide critical resources, you know, like water, they address overheating, prevent flooding and, and improve air quality. And we're increasingly aware of the link between urban parks and our physical and mental health, having lived through through the pandemic. But I think what is less well understood is the link between well-planned and, and evenly distributed natural spaces with social equity and community cohesion. Um, and that was a really a sort of driving force behind the Park Power project about how we can increase natural capital within our urban environments, but also what impact that can have on, on the citizens, as well as vegetation, wildlife and, and the ecosystems they support. So I'm just going to show you a, sh a very short film, it's a, a minute long, uh, and then a couple of slides, which which will show some of the outcomes. Uh, and, and, and then I will sort of hand over to Asha to to to, to talk about um Wild Streets. Well I'll just try and share my screen now. Um, bear with me. So hopefully can you see my screen there? Yeah? Great. And I'll make that full screen. Okay. So you can see the LDN Collective slide, uh, hopefully, yeah. Right, okay. So, um, so, so, so that's what sort of led us to carry out the uh, the Park Power project, and and what we did was we asked um, three thousand Londoners, so living in every borough of London across the thirty odd boroughs, what, what they valued about their parks and 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 their ideas for the future, using the Commonplace, the digital engagement platform. Uh, and I think that the the sort of headline here was that the pandemic increased the perceived value of parks in the minds of Londoners and, and everyone, really. It was the only places we could go to and use when we were in the lockdowns, the only places that were accessible. But it also, that because of that, it increased a lot of the problems in terms of high usage and demands from different types of users, cyclists, joggers, you know, social events. And, and it caused a lot of problems for people that actually maintain in, uh, the parks and, and the health of the parks. So there was a lot of additional litter and, and, and you know, the, the provision of toilets came into a sharp focus. And so our, our aim was to help the owners and managers of parks um, to do the most they can with the limited resources they have. Um, but also people that are creating and designing new parks in terms of, you know, regeneration pro projects so that they can do that in a way that is um, based on evidence of, 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 of what people um, think. So, so it was a collaboration between uh, the City of London, who own a lot of green spaces outside the square mile, including, you know, Hampstead Heath and Epic Forest and elsewhere. Uh, Siemens, the technology company, um, London National Park City, the Bruno Foundation, which is a mental health charity and so we created a sort of crowdsourced vision for the future so the, here's a short film which um, describes the project and and the outcomes um hopefully uh, succinctly at a time when parks are so precious and so pressurized we ask londoners what they love about them and there are their ideas for the future. Thousands of people responded. So, what did we learn? We want more nature and quiet places to escape to. And we want to make them easier to get to and to get around. We want to grow food and show our kids how it's grown. With community spaces for different cultures, abilities and age groups. We can make parks smarter, but tech should be invisible. Using natural materials, which are recyclable, all powered by renewable energy. We have now published our research and recommendations for the future, and we'd love to hear what you think. Download the ebook and help us shape the future of our green spaces. 
So, so that's a sort of short summary. And, and as as it, as it mentions there, there is a, an ebook uh, which is a lot longer, which which covers a lot of the research that was done. Um, and I'll put a um, a link to that in the chat uh, in a, after this. Um, but just to sort of touch on some of the things um, that, that came out of it in terms of um, ideas and, and initiatives. Um, one of the main conclusions was that parks needed to be more socially inclusive and welcoming for people of different age groups and abilities and, and ethnicities, as well as being safer environments for women and girls, particularly at night. Um, it's interesting, I think it's this weekend that where an organisation that, that um, campaigns for uh, making um, spaces more sort of equitable in terms of um, better spaces for girls and 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 for women. I think it's called Make Space for Girls. And they're asking women and girls to, to go out and, and actually ever, uh, take down notes about who's using certain activities like um, playgrounds and skate parks and and what the gender balance is and, 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 and how that might help inform the design of these and, and, and provision of these spaces. But one of the main concerns people had about smart parks was, was that technology needs to be invisible. No, nobody wanted to be working from parks. In many ways, the most important thing was that we needed somewhere to get away from the, the, the stresses of everyday life and, and, um, and, and can reconnect with nature. But they did want technology to help make parks safer, more accessible and inclusive. So, so we developed a concept for renewable energy networks, which could help achieve these goals. Um, they could have these digital touch points, intelligent lighting, um, smart bins, uh, and things like automated gates, which actually are, are quite a big drain on resource, a financial resource often with, with most parks we found. But that can all be self-powered and provide power back to the grid, making it carbon positive. And you can actually retrofit what's already there, like playground and exercise equipment with dynamos to produce power. And, 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 um, and, and I think that's a quite an interesting thing to think about. This final slide just shows how one of the outcomes of that could be to have self-powered lampposts or, or, or illuminated stanchions, which could keep the immediate area lit at night and, and making it safer. Um, and, and, you know, colour changing LEDs can complement nighttime activities or cultural festivals. So that was just some of the thinking behind that. And then, as I say, what, this is what uh, led me to then meet Asha. I think she, she, she saw what we'd done. And so I will hand over to her now to tell you uh, more about, about Wild Street. So Asha, over to you. Thank you so much, Max, for that introduction. And uh, uh, yeah, park power <laughs> was indeed uh, one of the things that led me to Max. Um, we had been working for Wild Streets already for quite a while, and we've been in dialogue with organizations such as C40, the, the London National Park City, um, and shaping the concept. But I think when we then were able to catch Max's attention and, you know, that, that uh, abundance of work he has behind it. We knew that we were really we were onto something um, that could be that could be really great. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about where I'm from because I actually have absolutely no experience working with urban forestry, with tech, with uh, with with nothing in the in, in the in, in the urban placemaking space. But what I do have is uh, a background. Uh, with the United Nations. I've been working as a consultant for 10 years, working with sustainability uh, top down. And when I moved to London, um, that changed basically because of the environment I suddenly was in. I um, am a big pedestrian, I walk everywhere. Um, so to move to a city coming from, coming from Denmark where uh, there is no such thing as a private park, moving to London, and seeing a lot of fenced in spaces, seeing the discrepancies in, in the access to nature that started the idea of well, how can we create um, space, a green, a green space, accessibility to green space everywhere. Um, and at that time, augmented reality was something that uh, it was still very much the level of releasing, uh, I believe, dinosaurs at street level, uh, but IKEA, had actually come out with a fantastic app called Place. 
that for the first time made augmented reality into something really pragmatic. You could you could now place um, furniture at a centimeter's accuracy um, in uh, in your house. So it seems like a low hanging fruit, but why why can't we do the same um, uh, for for urban greening? And I started having conversations with the Tree Design and Action Group, with the Transport of London, from with the London National Park City Foundation, which was start, just starting up around that point. And, um, and, uh, and it very quickly became clear that what was needed was an, a tool that could get uh, urban, uh, urban co-creation, that could get democratic uh, placemaking out of city halls, and to become something we could do in in real time at this at the space where we feel safety, and which is what much more like the Park Power Project makes Y Streets an abundantly humane project. It's about creating safety at where people are and enabling them, enabling them uh, to participate in the green uh, transition of their cities. Um, so let me let me share my my screen. Um, here we are. And just for reference, here are both um, my email and, and, and Max's uh, for your convenience. Um, I will jump over Max's presentation here. And there we are. So we are called Wild Streets. And we are the first world's first augmented reality app for co-creating urban green places. Um, some of our major supporters is something called the Arbor Day Foundation, which is one of the largest green, uh, one of the largest tree planting organizations in the world. Uh, we're also just recruiting partners with, but they firmly believe that our app will revolutionize how professionals, how citizens, they go about greening the hyper-local space. It very much as Romy uh, hinted to in the beginning at 15.9 that we have a time, 10 year time uh, left <laughs> to act on uh, to act on that specific goal and the IPCC was out recently here in March and you're really encouraging everyone to get on with it there's a small window that is closing very rapidly and there's a a, there's a, a, a quite a significant understanding of the natural infrastructure and how we design with ecosystem service benefits in mind is how we actually close that gap. Uh, low carbon cities that promote human health and the same way provide spaces for nature, create, create biodiversity hotspots. And to make natural infrastructure something that is sustainable, co design is the answer. Um, empowering people to take part in that process, giving them ownership of natural infrastructure, making them making the acceptance of the changes that need to happen is abundantly important to secure that process. Uh, so we need to enable greening at scale with broad public support. We and you can see that everywhere it's everywhere is going green as is from at the hyper local level at small spaces to, to uh, master planning spaces. Greening is really at the core of everything that is happening. Um, unfortunately, uh, our research shows that in our many dialogues with councils of all budget levels for our dialogues with C40, with, with organizations that are so deeply invested in engagement and the greening process that the tools available for engagement, for visualizations, they are very exclusive by nature. They're expensive. They are slow because they require a lot of face-to-face uh, -face time, citizen engagement on site. And often they come with poor results. It is the same demographic group that over and over again take part in, in, in these processes. And the, the, the result is that you get, you're basically designing the same space for the same people everywhere. But if you had a tool, that would actually allow people to uh, everywhere to be uh, able to engage on site, uh, no matter the time limitation, no matter their awareness situation, that they are able to to participate in in the global greening projects going on locally, nationally, what have you. Um, so our um, um, 
our work has resulted in quite a, a firm concept and I would like to show you a short a minute and a half video that I think uh, captures it uh, pretty well. Um, I hope. We are building an app that lets you co-create the beautiful, livable cities of tomorrow. You will be able to plan true to scale 3D models of stunning trees and plants, no matter where you are in the world. Here's how it works. Scan your surroundings and select from the catalog of species suitable for your geographical location. Now move, spin, grow, and plant. Check out how your greenery will look like over time and in different seasons. And learn about the multidimensional benefits of the trees you've selected. Wild Streets lets you design the city of your dreams. And by sharing it with the world on social media, you can inspire others to let nature move back into their neighborhood as well. Wild Streets also lets you invite anyone to step into your green vision for a specific location and experience it in real time. Let's recreate our cities like green corridors that make physical activity healthy and safe. Why not let locals design their high streets to bring back foot traffic, or let children create awesome green playgrounds and schoolyards? We want to create a new chapter for urban planning, where co-creation is truly inclusive. We do this by collecting users' social data to learn about design preferences across demographic segments. We'll then share aggregated information with planners and decision makers, enabling them to make better solutions for local communities. Wild Streets wants to facilitate urban greening everywhere so that our expanding cities are nice places to grow old in and amazing to grow up in. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and Sorry, my screen has just frozen. Oh, I'm so sorry. There we are. All oh, right. Um, there are uh, there are there are a lot of dimensions of wild streets, but there are particularly some key features that I would like to uh, elaborate a bit about. Um, the one being that wild streets are so fortunate that we've become we've gotten on the radar of Apple, who's looking for uh, that green um, green uh, app tool uh, that can really help. Um, facilitate urban greening. Uh, and what is so interesting, and which is why we've, and I'm gonna tell you more about our infrastructure in a second, but we are so fortunate to be teamed up with really, really uh, excellent uh, uh, developers uh, who will work together with Apple on, um, on pushing the AR technology as is. And what was hinted at in the video is that you are able to reload other people's design, meaning that any of you can go to your street uh, green your surroundings and your neighbor can go out and reload it and react to it. In the same way, let's say that there is an engagement process locally where you first have input from, from locals who's just greening, you can take to the drawing table to landscape architects who can then make a green scenario for the area and then you can have people reload that scenario again and they can stress test it, so to say, they can react to that. So that's one feature. The other one is the right tree for the right place. I'm a macroeconomist, so data is something that really matters to me. Um, and we have uh, teamed up with iTree, so who are our global da data partners, We're working with Maya School University in the UK. We have uh, an abundance of data partners who is enabling us at the hyperlocal level to recommend the right, uh, the right selection of, of tree and plant species for a location that is optimized according to what are the flooding risks, what are pollution levels, what, what, kind, what kind of biodiversity gaps are there, and also looking at the existing tree population because uh, any tree will, will thrive better in perhaps more diverse uh, populations of trees. Um, so our, our, our number of indicators are quite extensive. And the same way our collaboration with both iTree and local in the UK tree economics uh, we are optimizing the, the ecosystem service benefit calculations so that there is an awareness component of wild streets, meaning that uh, once you've created your design for your local, your local street, you will get an indication of, well, what value of that nature is there to my health, to uh, the environment, even economically. Uh, a second factor is, uh, has to do with imagination or the lack thereof. 
when we lived in the same street or the same environment for, for, for any amount of time, it's hard to imagine it looking anything different. And we are looking, we are working with Speedtree, which provides uh, really super realistic tree, tree vectors uh, to the movie and gaming industry. Um, and you want to touch the bark when you see the trees uh, through, the, through the app. Uh, and we, what we're doing is we are creating micro environments that people is also able to place, say uh, a small seating environment, which includes uh, trees, plants, planters with, with, with flora, uh, but also very much benches, um, because to reap, for people to reap the full benefits of nature, there needs to be uh, another kind of infrastructure, and that is seeding, that is uh, playground elements, that is um, uh, bike and racks that allow you to, to park your bike and take a walk in, in nature. Um, and thirdly, um, we are we accumulating a lot of data in, in, uh, as, as, as people are using the app. And to make that data useful for planner side, for the professional side, we have uh, inside dashboards that takes all the data we that we generate both about the nature, about the ecosystem service benefits, and also about the, the designs that locals are making cross-reference with the demographic profiles. Uh, we are creating visuals, and we're creating overviews about what is it people want, depending on who they are, um, and what kind of benefits can we reap uh, from those designs. Um, so our, um, our, our triple helix, our focus point is on the one hand, making a tool that is really an exciting, fun, uh, gamified experience for citizens. Um, so the entire user experience is focused on, um, on, on creating something that is really visually appealing uh, and that can be used by citizens absolutely everywhere. I actually, um, I quit my job at the UN a few years back and to, we've been bootstrapping by streets ever since. And I took on a delivery job with Gorillas uh, to keep the ship floating. And one of the insights I, I got from that when walking up and down staircases was actually to see the posters within hallways of almost every second hallway I was in and see the local calls for let's create green backyards. Let's come together and push the local authorities to, to green uh, this space outside our building. So we know just from a citizen aspect, there is a huge call for tools that makes it easier to communicate um, visually to the public sector about that they want changes locally. At the same time, we're speaking to such a broad window of, um, of NGOs, of tree planting organizations uh, who really want to use the app in order to be better uh, utilize their broad, their, their broad um, uh, channels that they already have in place uh, with, with local residents um, and, and enable them to create better tools. So um, we want to become the default software for the public sector. Um, we're speaking to the GLA, we're speaking to um, um, local authorities in, in so many different areas who's looking for that tool that enables them to, put, to, um, to require a certain amount of public engagement on the one hand, that enables uh, locals everywhere to, uh, to participate. And that really not only creates better engagement, it also creates a, a much more wide ranging engagement where you really can catch um, people of all ages, of all backgrounds, because it's a handheld tool that is at their disposal wherever they are. Uh, and for the professional sector, and I will dive a bit more into that now. For professional sector, we are also implicit uh, creating a pressure by becoming the default software for the public sector uh, and hence creating a, a demand for good engagement and uh, for better visuals. We're also creating a pressure for the professional sector um, to adopt our software. On the, however, we have a huge array of testing partners in the professional sector. And one of the things, um, sorry, I'm just skipping over this one now. The, uh, the, the app will, will, will serve uh, a practice all the way through their project cycle from doing um, simple research in terms of the right tree for the right place, but doing that uh, essential engagement that is necessary 
from, to, from testing uh, their designs uh, on a broader scale to actually doing um, marketing at a really cost-effective way where you can show uh, your, your full area design uh, in, you know, in, in the, at the, at the, at, at, at human eyesight. Um, so in that way, Wild Street is really um, aimed at becoming an, a necessary tool that integrates in the, in the professional sector's existing softwares and really complement their work. Um, so this is a look at, a rough look at how it looks like. Um, we are creating um, what, what, what we call for the time being design campaigns that enables uh, practices in the public sector and any NGO and creating specific uh, campaigns for a local area, meaning that you can, for example, a council we're speaking to, they're doing uh, an, a project for um, a tube station um, for the upper ground area for tube station. And in here you can highlight, well, what are the environmental issues we want to address? It could be flooding, for example. Um, we also want to address the whole idea of active travel for this particular campaign. And in that area, you're able to to drag people into this specific area, put up QR codes in the local environment and have people um, engage with, with, um, with this specific campaign that you have uh, that you have for this site. The right-hand side um, of the screen gives you an idea about how, what it is you will see when you place elements. It's of course still very rough what you see here, but it gives you an idea about um, uh, the, the trees, the, 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 the vectors you will, you will be able to, plot, to choose from, uh, the dialogue that will be served for you within the app that will be optimized according to which cam campaign you're in, or even the feedback that you are able to uh, give through the app. Um, we, there we go. Um, so we, we actually started out as an NGO when we first Actually, also met Max. We we were in fact an NGO, but we uh, took the decision of becoming a limited company, uh, with the idea we wanted to create a really sustainable uh, business model that is uh, that offers a subscription model to the professional sector and for the public sector. Uh, our core services are free and will forever be free because that was the foundation that we wanted to start at. Meaning that um, councils, uh, schools, hospitals you name it, has free availability of the app and can use this uh, to create dialogue and really powerful visuals that previously was not available. Um, a bit about our infrastructure. We have, uh, I'm sorry, it's jumping now. Um, I'm so sorry, it's jumping. Um, let me just get back here. Um, oh no. Uh, Um, so sorry. So sorry, it's jumping. Um, we, there we go. <laughs> As I mentioned, we have um, a whole bunch of partnerships in place already for data. This is a glimpse of it. And the right hand side, um, these are the two uh, companies that we are, we are collaborating with. And they know exactly what they're doing in terms of creating really good, usable, um, engaging uh, uh, applications. Uh, both Set Snail and Nuacom, they are award-winning uh, companies. They were with uh, Google, IKEA, and NASA, Nike, you name it, and created applications with uh, plus 40 million downloads. Uh, so we're really thrilled to be working with very skilled uh, companies. At the same time, uh, this gives you a little glimpse of our network. We are in dialogue with so many councils. Um, we have an open API that will enable us to do really cool integrations down the line. We're forward thinking also in terms of AI. Um, and uh, we've also been so fortunate to always already to be invited to work uh, on, 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 different, um, on different projects once the app is testable uh, and live. That, that includes um, uh, the Culture Mile uh, with the Foundation for Future London, it, it includes uh, uh, Camden City Council, it includes uh, the Madrid Metropolitan Forest, which is a 20 years project with a green build around the city. Um, and we're just so thrilled already to have 
that level of interest. And we're not doing this alone. I actually, I, and I have him in the comment field. I have my co-founder Jai Sandhu, um, who is um, a, 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 a product engineer. Um, and behind us, we also have an amazing board of, um, uh, of advisory group members uh, that really represent the entire area of, of uh, the planning, uh, the greening, uh, the scientific, um, uh, the green spectrum, and we're for uh, the, the concept is really taking shape uh, to the, with, with help from from every single of these individuals. Um, so yes, I, I will uh, leave it at this, and we're really keen on uh, having dialogue with anyone interested in hearing more about how we can work together. Anyone interested in uh, testing the, the app um, and just if you have general questions about um, our roadmap and uh, and and the features uh, of live streets so thank you Romy for introduce for introducing us and inviting us today to talk yeah you're welcome thank you Asha that was brilliant um, it seems like a good time to release our poll should we do that now and then uh, give people a few moments to think about any questions they've got um, I'll launch this first question and honestly, I'll be really worried if we don't get 100% of uh, one answer. Um, I'm hoping, you can, yes, you can see that. I've seen the answers <laughs> given the audience we have. Um, anybody considering it unimportant would be slightly worrying, uh, but I'm seeing the answers coming in now. I think we've got another few people if you want to vote on that and then... Um, I can let you know. I don't think it's a spoiler. It's 100% of people saying very important, which is a relief, I think, to everybody. Thank you for everyone who voted. Um, the next one, I shall uh, just share that one very quickly to show you. And then the next one, um, we can move on to, I shall launch that poll. Sorry, I'm staring at the other screen, which is never good. Um, we can do the second question, I think. Uh, so this one is about engagement. Um, can everybody see that? I'm, I'm not sure if it's launched or not. Can you see a box on your screen about the engagement aspect? Yeah, okay, great. So that should be ready for voting as well. Um, again, I hope it's important to you. Sorry, uh, Romy, mine is still on the number one. I don't oh, know. Oh, okay. No, I don't know. It's being a bit peculiar. Yeah. Okay. I need to end that one, maybe. Um, engagement, I think. Yeah. There uh, we go. Can you ignore question two? That's snuck in from somewhere else. It is just question one, which is how important is engagement to your work? Um, I think it's fair enough if you chose the second one, but uh, I'm hoping that, um, yes, somebody has. <laughs> I think that's understandable. But anyone who considers engagement to be not at all important, again, I think maybe you ought to find a new role. <laughs> um, OK, well, it's it, it's coming out pretty clearly as very important. I'll share this one as well. Um, I think you can see it's very important, but there is obviously some concern, which I think you alluded to, Asher, about the cost of uh, traditional routes to engagement. And I'll um, just release the uh, final one, um, which is about practice. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to see this one. Is that one visible now, the third question on practice? I'm a bit rusty on the polls. Uh, actually, no, sorry. No, yeah. no. OK, let me try again. Um, I don't know why it's getting very glitchy. It's not liking. Stop sharing. Try this one. OK, this might work better. Yeah. 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 So sorry, just a quick gleaning of information from everybody out there. Um, and, and this is really, do you see Wild Streets as being applicable to what you do? We're hoping that after that, everybody does see opportunities. Oh, got them all over the place now. Okay, this is going to be an interesting one, obviously, because it's multiple choice. So we'll see um, what comes through. I think we've probably got most people voted. I'll give you a couple more seconds. 
everyone can just press the buttons. Right, let me share this because we want to move on to any questions that people have, I think. Okay, so there you go. Um, visualization seems to be a really popular aspect, which I guess makes sense um, given the nature of what we've been talking about. But they're pretty balanced, actually. I hope that's useful information for you in a, in a small yeah, very uh, poll. Hmm, seems to be all of those are hitting the target. So that's, that's good. Right. So, um, I shall move on to, um, questions from anybody out there. I'm not sure if we have any right now. I think Matt yeah, asked we, a little while ago. We, we do have one um, okay. in the Q and A from Casper Schwartz. Oh, hello, Casper. And yep. he's, he's asked, and I think this is probably one for you, Asha, uh, what is the current time scale for when the app will go live? So we are in pre-seed funding right now, and we're progressing uh, quite well, which means that uh, pre-seed would allow us to create a prototype uh, that allows us to, to do some really good testing, that allows us to um, really uh, make proof of concept. Um, and within that, we are in a three months timeline from that. Uh, and once seed funding is, is secured, uh, it should be about a year from uh, from from the point of pre seed is is, is secured. So full a full year uh, for complete development. Are you looking for collaborators, Asher? Oh, at this point, uh, I mean, in the audience, if people have a burning desire to get in touch, obviously they can. But is that something that you are looking for? More testing partners? Yes, absolutely. Um, the more the merrier. So we have testing partners from. NGOs, tree planting from uh, local authorities, from the professional sector, uh, but we are we are just keen on having giving giving people a good seat at the table. We're creating a tool that's supposed to be as functional and as usable for absolutely everyone, so we can, in fact, facilitate urban greening at a really effective scale. Um, mm. So, so we're really keen on more testing partners, more partners in general. Okay, so everybody has your contact details um, and we just encourage you to do that and get in touch, I think. Um, so another couple of questions. Arc Noop, I'm not sure who that is. Uh, will the app have the ability to show ideas in a more wireframe style format so you don't close the design conversation down too quickly, which can happen when you use photorealistic montages? That makes a lot of sense. So, uh, could you repeat? So that? It, will the app have the ability to show ideas in a more wireframe style rather than a, a very realistic montage, which is what you've shown? I mean, that, um, is, that is the idea. We're that is some of, that is some of the feedback we're getting from from the professional mm. sector, and so we are working specifically with the professional sector in creating uh, also desktop version that allow that that basically takes all the design input and generates. Um, uh, visuals to create uh, image output uh, that enables you to work with the files afterwards. So that mm. is definitely the idea. Yeah. Yeah, that makes that makes complete sense. And Matt from Gillespie's um, can proposed development to be uploaded to the app to see how wild streets can influence future development. Another yep. good question. Exactly. And and uh, our developers uh, will enable two things. The one being that you can. Uh, you can create with your existing CAD software, you can create a landscape design. because so obviously this is where the professional sector is most comfortable. It's also perhaps more convenient that you could sit at a desk desktop. Then mm -hmm. you can then download that to the app and put that to the test. You can view it yourself. You can, you can invite an audience uh, that can then create, provide their feedback. That can also move elements around and so, sort of say, um, you know, challenge that design that has been created already. And at the same time, uh, designs can then also be taken back up and created, created into 3D and brought back into CAD software. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's really like a, a full circle software that is meant to be integratable uh, with a practice existing uh, tools. Yeah, which is what everybody's wanting, I guess, to avoid any duplication of work or Exactly. Re restarting. No, that's that's great. Um, Unia from uh, McGregor Coxall. Hello. Uh, what is the process of becoming involved in testing? 
Uh, that is really, it's so individual. I think the best thing is to send us an email uh, and we can, we can start a dialogue. Okay, no, that's great. And we, if, if anyone needs those contact details and they didn't catch them from before, do, do let us know. We can pass those on for both of you. Um, pop my email in there. Okay, chat, yeah, that would be great. Um, and Matt asked, um, I think to everyone, I mean, anybody else who wants to answer really maybe in the Q&A, but do you foresee this becoming integrated with wider social media platforms? Um, because he can see professionals sharing people's visions on LinkedIn and the like. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think, I think a really important point is the, the shareability of what we're creating. We're creating something that, you know, feeds into people's storytelling. Storytelling today using social media is such a huge thing. It's so, it's so part of, you know, our, the, 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 I think all generations today to uh, report on our lives through social media, comment and what have you. The app itself allows you to A, taking pictures and videos with your augmented design. So the idea of things going viral, something creating a foundation for discussion on social media, via likes, commenting, it suddenly becomes something that uh, public sector or anyone, they can't ignore something that has gone viral. So definitely it, on the one hand, that is the element, but at the same time, um, why is it just really cost effective in many ways? Meaning that you can also share uh, as, as a practice or as a council, you can share that engagement process, you can share visuals on social media, uh, and it just creates a completely new way of creating insights into what uh, green infrastructure development is happening, absolutely. I think it is a real hub, isn't it, bringing together all of those bodies, as you, as you mentioned, you know, it's, it, it seems to just be at the centre of all that, so it, it has huge potential, and I think the timing um, especially now, Max mentioned Make Space for Girls and the launch of a, a new parks document around that uh, topic. And hopefully that will be brought into the Green Flag Awards in parks and, you know, and rolled out. So it seems to be really of the moment, um, particularly that sort of aspect, capturing what very specific groups would like to see in their green space. And obviously the need, the pressing need for more green space everywhere for everyone. Absolutely. And I think the interest in Wild Street really took off during COVID. Uh, this necessity of creating this 15 minute city, the necessity of creating um, valuable green areas, healthy areas in your immediate surroundings. It took on a completely new level, the, the emergency of creating fresh air <laughs> yeah. um, in your immediate surroundings also became, became something. Even we have a lot of, of requests for taking wild streets to rooftops as well, which is completely feasible on a more, uh, uh, it requires, it's definitely on, on, um, uh, on, on you know, our, our pipeline projects, but to create uh, the edible city is definitely also something that is, I know from Max Project with Park Power, that is a huge call for locals to be able to green to, to grow their own uh, vegetables, their own, um, their own fruit gardens as well. So absolutely, uh, mm -hmm. I think Wild Streets have so many different entry points. We have interest from people uh, working on greening public spaces such as airports, main stations. So biophilic is also something uh, that Wild Streets propose for. So there's, I think it's only the imagination putting the limit to how the app can be applied. Mm. Um, he's unfortunately gone now, but my my colleague um, Irvin was was listening in, and as you know, we've been trying to persuade him to uh, release all of our DWGs to you. And I think he's coming around to it. I will check. Uh, but having having just watched the first half and uh, having lots of conversations, so I'm really sorry he's not here because I was planning on bringing him in. Um, but we're hoping very much, as we did with Pathfinder, um, giving open access to all of our furniture um, for use in that uh, particular software that we, we will be able to do the same so people can show where they'd like a seat or a plant or a cycle stand or you know whatever um, elements that they think would bring something more to the streetscape so that's sort of breaking news and not a hundred percent but I think it's very likely that we'll be able to do that for you pretty soon. Fantastic. Excellent. Great. Very good news. Mm. Yeah. So does anybody, oh there's another question I think suddenly appeared. Um, yes, uh, you can read it yourself, but I'll, I'll read it okay. out just in case. Um, 
Will the app be able to coordinate existing services into the visioning as this can prove a major influence on where and how streets can be greened, even if only to propose new routes for them? Yeah, the perennial tree pit issue. <laughs> um, in terms of existing services, in terms of what is already there of greenery? I think they're no, meaning I think cable. It's probably, yeah, utilities yes. on the ground. Yes. Yeah. I'm yeah. I mean, the, the thing about that is it's different in different uh, regions and countries in terms of how much information is 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 available uh, 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 on on what's mapped underground. And in this country, we're quite far behind. Others have quite full mapping of uh, underground utilities and archaeology and 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 different layers uh, that that can be publicly accessible. But it did. There was a report recently in, in the BBC News, I think, saying that um, the government mm -hmm. is now committing to make that data available, and it, it, the mapping has been going on. So as soon as it is, then we can integrate that with Wild Streets, and then we can have a much more accurate uh, understanding of what can and can't be done in terms of planting and tree pits. Yeah. Yeah, and we have something we call a confidence index that reflects the uh, local availability of data and the quality thereof. And that is meant to uh, create a pool for data. Um, and what's really extraordinary, we, for example, with our friends at the Manchester Trees of Cities, they have already said, well, let's give you local data. Let's increase that hyper-local accuracy of the species that, that your app uh, is able to suggest through the app. Um, and as Max mentions, um, the availability, availability of, of, of utility information, it's it's so different, it's so scarce. For example, our partners in New York, they really know where, what is absolutely everywhere, but uh, yeah. Europe but, is just so much older. So um, it's yeah. it's a process. And the same with soil quality, it's also something um, we'll be working towards. Mm. I've put the link to that article because it is quite interesting in terms of how much progress is being made here. Uh, 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 but I, I think that's only gone to the hosts and panelists. Matt. Oh, we can we, we can share need, that. Uh, yeah, share yeah, that with everybody. Yeah, I saw that. I, I, uh, very, it was very recent, wasn't it? And I think yeah. in terms of confidence weeks, factor, yeah. I, I would be fairly confident that they have almost zero information <laughs> in most of the places I've ever worked, and it's you know yeah. it's all yeah. down to trial yeah. pits and what. Well, they've no. tested it in the northeast <laughs> of England, and they said they were going to roll it out throughout England, Wales, and Northern Ireland by 2025. Wow! So, well, we'll see. Yes, yeah, so that, I mean that's <laughs> that's critical, yeah. isn't it? Really, to it get is. a tree in anywhere. Yeah. So, it yeah, is. that that would be a great uh, addition to it. Uh, we're very, very near the end. I don't know if anybody else has a burning question, or if you'd like to say anything else, Usher or Max, at this moment in time. But we ought to try and draw to a close. Uh, not anything else that um, we're really keen on continuing mm. conversation with everyone. Please share no. the word about Wild yeah. Streets. Um, yeah. And um, yeah. and yeah, we are hoping to be able to very soon take the first prototype out there mm. uh, and create some really yeah. awesome engagement uh, and, events. And I'm looking forward to visiting your HQ in uh, Oslo in a few weeks' time. I know, that was maybe. supposed to be top secret, Max, because everyone oh, gets oh, very right. Well, everyone who's <laughs> not coming gets very upset. No, it's fine. But... <laughs> <laughs> not anymore. Pretty, no, yeah. pretty much two, two weeks' time, yes. We have yes, a, yes. another small customer group uh, going to look at how things are done in Oslo. So, yeah, that, that will bring some more learnings, I'm sure. Um, but yes, we shall feed back on, on all of that. And uh, yes. yeah, everyone's very excited. And I'm so sorry to everyone else who's not coming yet. There will be other chances, I'm sure. there will be other chances, It all gets a little bit tetchy. So yeah, no, it's fine. Um, but I'd better close now. We've just got a couple okay. of minutes, if, if that. Um, so I hope this all has made sense in terms of SDG 15, as we, as we sort of laid it out at the beginning, and that you can see ways to bring this into your work and make positive changes. I think, you know, in, in a year's time, it certainly appears that that's going to be the case. And we're trying with this speaker series to make these SDGs more tangible so that you understand how you can bring those in and, and use them in your own life, um, because it can sometimes be a little bit sort of business plan-y and, uh, and not too tangible. Um, we do promote them through our newsletter. So if you're not already signed up, please do. You'll find it on this bright yellow page that always makes me look sickly on our um, About Us page on the website. And we have a varied range of FICA topics, um, hostile design, inclusive public spaces, all, all sorts of uh, plans coming up. 
So do do make sure you're on there and follow us on probably Instagram. That's our biggest um, presence, I think, covering these topics as well. So uh, if you're not already signed up, you might like to do that. Um, we're currently planning the next speaker. If anyone has any brilliant ideas that they'd like to see or, or if you'd like to speak, please let us know. Uh, we're very open as long as we can fit it within an SDG. We're very happy to host any kind of conversation. Hope you've enjoyed this session. I know um, everyone's time is is uh, really you know limited these days. We're all so busy, and everyone's also looking forward to the bank holiday weekend. I think so. Um, you know, it's it's a tricky time. Uh, you can catch up with this and others. They are all on our website, so take a look um, on there for that uh, particular link. And do remember that this counts as CPD. And if you're a landscape architect, this is probably uh, a good one for your five hours minimum of climate emergency related CPD. So, um, you know, do do clock that because I think it comes to an end this month or next month. So make sure you don't miss out on that. And of course, we have our formal ones if you'd like to know more about anything else. So it just remains to say thank you and uh, have a great weekend. Thank you particularly to all of you and Asher and Max for sharing this uh, fascinating insight into this really exciting new app. And also my colleagues, Matt and Jack, who've been hiding and helping out in the background today. So uh, we'll, we'll see you at the next one, hopefully. And have Thank a great bank holiday. Thanks, 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 Ashley. Take care. See you soon.